My name is uh, Rob Simmons, and I'm a independent computer science educator and curriculum designer in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm talking today about an idea called contracts, uh, and using contracts for getting more programs less wrong. Um, just so you know in advance, I'm not really expecting that I'll have um, a lot of time for questions, but if I do, I'll take them from Slidio or Slido or Zelda or whatever it's called. Um, and so uh, the inspiration for this talk comes in many ways from Gary Bernhardt's 2015 talk uh, called, at Strange Loop called Ideology. And I want to start by talking about two of the ideas that he presented in that talk. Um, and I'm calling these two ideas the leap and the gap. So the example that I've modified a little bit from his talk is the notion of a function hue that takes uh, a red, green, blue value and returns a floating point value in the range between 0 and 365 that represents the RGB value's hue. Why 0 to 365? Um, because hue is a measure of degree in a polar coordinate system, which I didn't know before I wrote this talk. Maybe you did, but I think that's cool. Anyway, a red, green, blue value in this setting is going to be a tuple of three floating point values, which we're going to treat as between, uh, being between 0 and 1. That's our example. We're not going to talk about implementing this function. I just want you to think about what we would mean to specify this function and to test it. Well, we want some examples. So we've got a green and a blue and a nice dark yellow. Um, and we would want to make sure in our test cases that these inputs to the function all actually produced the desired um, output. So we would specify that here. And at this point, we make what I'm calling the leap. From our very small number of tests, we're going to make a leap of intuition or reason or faith that our code is actually going to work right on the entire world of reasonable inputs that we might give to our function. Based on a small number of test cases, we assume that we'll always behave correctly. And even if you write thousands of test cases, for this kind of example, you're effectively testing 0% of the input space. Um, and also, this doesn't handle the realities of being in Ruby or JavaScript or Python or whatnot, because we've also got to deal not just with the uh, reasonable input, but we've got to deal with, okay, what happens if I pass null to this function? What's it going to do in that case? This probably needs to be a test case, so we specify this behavior. Um, and like, what happens if I, what's the hue of 33? Like, you know, most dynamic type systems are going to allow this input, and we have to think about this ahead of time. Um, red's a color, so do we need to give the hue of this color? Like, no, probably not, but if we don't think ahead of time of what we're going to do here, then we're going to be in trouble later on. Here's a, Another example of how we might be in trouble later on, if we only index this tuple by indices, then we would probably silently accept four uh, floating point numbers instead of three. And then we're in a situation where, OK, this is going to be a backward compatibility nightmare because someone's going to depend on this behavior. And if we change it, we're going to break someone's code, even though it was outside of the specification of our function as we understood it. Um, and then we have even like more cantankerous examples where we have three floating point numbers, just like we asked for, but they're outside the range of zero to one uh, inclusive. So the idea here is that we can't just write tests thinking about the reasonable inputs. We also have to write tests thinking about the entire world of unreasonable inputs that we might have to consider, which is a huge multi-dimensional space that was, by definition, things that we didn't want to think about. Um, but if we don't think about this ahead of time, someone's going to rely on it. And, um, and so this idea, this is what I'm calling the gap. This is the gap between our specification and what we actually uh, are allowed to pass the function, what the compiler allows the function to get. For dynamic types, this gap is 
traditionally pretty big. That's how dynamic type systems work. Maybe we're working in something like you know, a Java or a C, and at least at that point, we don't have to worry about getting a string where we ask for three floating point numbers. We still have to deal with the original sin of C and Java style languages, which is the null pointer exception. And so then we think, ah, I know how to deal with this one. I just go to Haskell or standard ML or whatnot. And then w that, those type systems have ways of excluding null pointers. And maybe you have some idea about technology that we could use to get rid of these last two examples where we have an out of range value. But if you don't have any idea about that, that's fine. Let's just go on because what I want to talk about is in the languages that we deal with, there's basically always going to be this leap, this leap between the tests that we wrote and the idea of correctness on our spec. And there's also going to be, um, and there's also going to be a gap a gap between the specification of our input and the, uh, and the inputs that we're allowed to give by the type system. This gap may be big, this gap may be small, but there's pretty much always going to be a gap. Um, and so it's in this context that I'm gonna talk about contracts as ways of solving this leap and this gap or dealing with this, and I'm gonna talk about the gap first. As an example here, I'm going to make a silly example that illustrates a terrifyingly real problem. We've got some function that does some crypto stuff. I don't know what it does, but it may be easy to imagine that we need this cryptography function to be given a very large prime number in order to work correctly. And it's probably easy to imagine that such a function could appear to work if you gave it a small or non-prime number, but would do something bad or insecure or violate your privacy or allow your code to be leaked to you know, Facebook or whatnot. And, um, and so if you see this kind of comment in code, you should be absolutely terrified because you're counting on the consumers of your code looking into whatever file you wrote this function in and wherever you wrote this comment and noticing that you had this requirement on your code this is really a big problem. So let's solve that problem by adding a star to our comment, which gives us a use of the magic comments anti-pattern, where we recognize this as a Java doc syntax, which means that this constraint on x is now going to be treated as a part of the specification of the function, and at least exported from where we wrote the function out into the world. Contracts, in this sense, are just an extension of this idea where instead of writing English constraints on X, we write a Boolean condition as a precondition to our function that talks about X. This says slash slash at requires, which is a use of the magic comments anti-pattern that recognizes this comment as either the Java modeling language or CNOT, an educational programming language, which I'll talk about later. Um, and this precondition um, is about as intelligible as the previous comment was, but it's also parsable as a Boolean condition by, uh, by the computer. Uh, we also needed the uh, x to be prime. We could express a weaker condition, like, oh, please, oh, please don't be even. But if we have a primality test, uh, test lying around, which we might if we're doing cryptography of uh, some sort, then we could just say, I, you know, I need this to be prime. And maybe you have some idea about technology that could enforce these kinds of conditions in the compiler, but maybe you don't, and that's fine too, because the idea with contracts is just to run these things when we're in debug mode. So if we try to call crypto stuff with a million and one, which is not prime, I checked. Don't ask me what the factors are. Uh, then we'll get a runtime failure in our code that says that the precondition number two failed because I checked whether it was prime and I found out that it wasn't and so that's bad and you're bad and feel bad. And if we give it a small prime number, uh, then we're going to get information that we failed the precondition. And the reason that this is really great, more than just sort of writing unit tests, is that we can then later on be writing debug mode where we've got some poorly thought through encryption and we're trying to do something to the string strange loop. And deep inside of our call stack, we have unbeknownst to us violated the precondition for crypto stuff, meaning that something is insecure or, you know, uh, or not private, and we will be because of the contracts being run at runtime in debug mode, get not just a notion that something went wrong with crypto stuff, but potentially a stack trace, which I've uh, cropped intentionally because I don't know what this code is. Um, 
to, uh, to give us the ability to find where this precondition violation actually happened in the code. Another example of how this use of contracts can really help us as developers is if we have the execution of some program and it's going along great and we're really happy and oh no, there was a null pointer exception or we can't read field B of undefined. And I hate it when this happens because the call stack isn't even going to help us. We have to trace the data dependency back through our code and uh, we have to trace the data dependency back through our code and we have to... Um, uh, and, you know, this code may even be written by, uh, by somebody else, and so we've got to deal with that. And so, like, we can't change this orange code, so we're going to end up putting a defensive check at this point in the code. And this is maybe helpful at first, but the notion of what even is someone else's code really does change over time. So as you develop your project, what you end up seeing is you get these defensive checks everywhere in your call stack. And these are really bad because they confuse what's actual program logic and what is, uh, you know, you have this intermingled notion of here's what's program logic and here's the code that I actually want to, uh, to be defensive to explain what I'm doing. Um, contracts are very helpful in this situation animation fail, uh, because, we can, uh, because we can turn all of our contracts off and run in production code because we had a uniform language uh, supported mechanism for explaining what these preconditions are. And then we can also run in uh, uh, debug mode where, we're, uh, where we've turned all of these defensive checks back on. So not only are our contracts a useful part of our documentation, our contracts are able to be executed and, and implemented uh, at runtime if we wish, but there's still a clear, clear separation of what's program logic and what's code. Uh, or what's program logic and what's uh, specification. So this is the first takeaway that I want you to get from this talk. Contracts fill a gap between what the types in force will be input to your function and what the actual input specification is. It's a language level support mechanism that allows us to both document for humans and enforce with computers the preconditions to our function. At this point I wanna uh, move from talking about the gap and talking about uh, preconditions to talking about this conceptual leap from test to full correctness and talking about that in terms of post conditions. Again, I'm gonna create a new test. This is a simple test. We're doing search for an int in an array that's not sorted. This is a nice example for this because there's no gap. We can treat this as any input is going to be, uh, that's allowed by the type system is like okay for an integer search function. And uh, if we start with that assumption, well, we're gonna write some tests because that's what we do. And what we're gonna say is this should return the index where uh, the integer is found. So if three is at index zero, return zero. If three is the zero, one, two, three, fourth thing in the array, we're going to return three. And, um, and then we also need some tests where we don't uh, find three anywhere in the array. And the standard thing to do in these situations seems to be to return negative one. Um, so again, at this point, we're going to make that conceptual leap to saying we've written our code, we've tested our function, and now we believe, or at least we sure hope, that this works correctly on all reasonable inputs. But this is pretty scary because probably the array index that we're returning is going to be immediately used to index a different array. So we would really like to know a little bit more uh, than our, our test cases provided that we actually produced a valid array index. And we can write another contract, this is an ensures or post condition contract, that says, all right, the result needs to be a valid array index. I'll wait, or it can be negative one. All right, this is better. Um, this contract tells us that, uh, that the result that we return has to be between negative one, and uh, it, if it's not negative one, it has to be a valid array index. This is, say, uh, this post condition is expressing the notion that the range, the valid outputs of our function are dependent on a property of the data we put into the function. And maybe you have some idea about how this could be enforced uh, by the compiler, but maybe you don't and that's fine because we can just run this at runtime and make sure that we never 
uh, give an out of bound um, array index from our search function. This is a pretty lightweight test. We could actually do a lot more and we could test full correctness of our search function. Full correctness of the search function means that we only return negative one if x was not actually anywhere. We only want to say we didn't find it if it wasn't there. And also, if we return an array index, that should be, really be where the thing was or else we have a clearly broken search. This will be the one time in the talk where I say you don't necessarily need to read this code, but I'm gonna flash it up to say that yes, we can enforce these English post conditions uh, as contracts. And at this point, this is a complete specification of search in a, for an integer in an array. Any function that satisfies this post condition is a valid search unless it changes the array, which would be really bad. Okay, now this is a complete specification of, uh, of what it means to be a search function and any satisfying uh, um, program is going, or anything that satisfies this post condition is a correct search function. Um, so at this point, I'm going to accuse us all of a grave sin. Most of the time we don't actually care about this picture where we really want to know that from our test cases we give the right thing on all outputs or all inputs. We don't care about all inputs. We just care about all the inputs that we're ever going to get. If we don't get caught, that's great. And, um, and, and uh, this is where this notion of post-condition testing comes up it is really useful because another way that we express the truth that I'm saying here is that we want to make sure that we test our function on realistic inputs. And you know what's a good way to generate realistic inputs? The rest of your program. And so with contracts enabled, every single test that we write that depends on find also is a test of find. So the takeaway here is that contracts can act as a double check on the results of every single function call. Contracts in this way make tests way more awesome. And we want tests to be more awesome because it's really hard to write tests. So the tests that we write, we should get as much mileage out of as we possibly can. So that's the story about how contracts help us address this gap between what the type system gives us as input and what we actually want as input, and this conceptual leap from our test to full correctness. This is a story that's about JML, and I do want to briefly talk about a different story. This other story uh, is about um, another line of work on contracts. So contracts are a fundamental idea that's been explored a lot in object-oriented languages, that's the JML idea, but they've also been explored in functional languages, especially the scheme and racket realms of the universe. And Contracts, as I describe them in JML, are uh, used as documentation and for testing. Um, there's this emphasis on making sure that they're very, very expressive so that they can narrow this leap and this gap as much as possible. Um, and we don't, you know, if it's not efficient, then maybe we don't care as much about that because we're only doing this in debug mode. In um, functional languages, there's been really cool research that I wish I had more time to talk about, about using contracts to check interface boundaries between different type systems, between different ways of checking your code at the compile time that have different static guarantees. And when you're doing that, the, the contracts look a little bit more typey than our contracts have. They look more like types. And also, we better be able to run those suckers fast because they are always on because the type system's safety guarantees are dependent on the contracts. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, and obviously in JML, we've talked, we don't want these contracts always to be on for double checking our find function that like we should get fired, uh, like on prod. And um, also, f functions are values in functional languages. I wish I could talk more about this, but there's a lot of research in making the fact that you're passing functions with contracts to functions like that's cool and I won't be talking about it. And the reason is what I want to talk about is another line of work in the Java world, which is not just checking interface boundaries by using contracts, but checking the internal properties of code and thinking about that code's correctness using contracts. You'll notice there are two asterisks here and the asterisks are because closure exists and I'm not gonna talk more about closure, but talk to me later. Um, 
I, at this point, want to talk more about this interesting idea that we could use contracts not just to enforce boundaries, but to enforce internal properties of code. This is where I think this gets really cool, but full disclosure, I'm an enormous nerd. Um, so the reason this gets cool is so far we've treated contracts like they're this black box, or we've treated uh, used contracts like functions are a black box. If we want to open up the guts of those functions and think not just about the input conditions and the output conditions, but their inner workings, what we end up needing are ways of talking about the invariance, the invariance of our data structures and the invariance of our control structures, in particular the invariance of our loops. I'm going to talk more about loop invariance because it basically lets me give you a tiny taste of the way that we present this material to undergraduates at, in Carnegie Mellon's uh, pr uh, Principles of Imperative Programming uh, uh, course, where, which I uh, had previously taught at for uh, three or four years. So uh, with that, let me say... There. Okay, we are now looking at a uh, TypeScript interpreter for the CNOT language, the uh, aforementioned programming language. And come on, give me my mouse. There we go. Uh, this is an implementation of the Fibonacci function in this uh, in this interpreter. You'll notice it's a it's a naive uh, functional implementation of the uh, of the Fibonacci function, and we know that because we've got. Um, it makes two recursive calls. It says if n is greater than one, then the Fibonacci number is the Fibonacci number of two steps back plus the Fibonacci number of one step back. And this is a hilariously inefficient way of calculating Fibonacci. So we can do Fibonacci of four and Fibonacci of five and Fibonacci of six. Uh, oh, that was a four again. Fib of six, okay. And uh, yeah, so we have uh, three, five, eight. This is the pattern that we expect from the Fibonacci. But it's hilariously inefficient. If I type fib of 30, then there's gonna be a really noticeable delay. And uh, if I type fib of 40, there's gonna be an even more noticeable delay because this is exponential in the size of the input. And so I <laughs> luckily have not crashed my laptop for the strange loop demo. And um, so what I want now is let's write a faster Fibonacci function. And the way that we're going to write a, Fib a faster Fibonacci function, you may vaguely remember this, but first we're going to say that uh, the specification of this function can be written using contracts. So we're going to require that, the, uh, that n is greater than or equal to one. Why greater than or equal to one? It solves a problem later, bonus points if you catch it. Um, and we're going to have as our post condition that the result is equal to the thing that the inefficient version would give. So this is a common pattern. You write the clear mathematical definition and then you use that to validate the hopefully faster, uh, maybe a little bit more complex. So there's a pretty standard technique for uh, using, for implementing fi uh, the Fibonacci function in this way, and you probably remember the general outlines, but if not, work through me. You, you, you need to keep both the current value and the previous value. So let's say int old and int new, and then we're gonna have some for loop with i as the loop variable. Um, we're gonna return new, and inside of this loop, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create the next value, which is old plus new. And then we're going to use that to update the value. So old gets new and new gets next. And so this is what we, the, you know, this is the, the general structure of how we write the Fibonacci function. And let's be honest with each other. If you were just doing this, what you would do at this point is you would write in some constants, you would see if you were off by two, one, or zero in which direction, and then you would adjust your constants until you had what seemed to be a correct implementation. Let's use contracts and see if we can do a little bit better than that. So the way that we're gonna do a little bit, so let's, you know, as a first point, we're gonna say that old is gonna be fib of zero, and new is going to be fib of one. These aren't, these aren't contracts, I'm just like keeping track of what I'm doing. Fob. 
Um, and at this point, the next thing that I'm going to write is a loop invariant. A loop invariant is a contract that's going to be checked before every iteration of the loop, including before the first iteration of the loop, and it's going to be checked after every iteration of the loop, including after the last iteration of the loop. And the loop invariant expresses what we think is always true about our loop, and intuitively, what we're doing here is because we're returning new, we want to be treating uh, invariant. We want to be treating new as fib of i, the current index, and we want uh, to enforce that the old is the trailing value. So we want to say loop invariant old equals fib of i minus 1. So this says that as a loop invariant that new is the leading value and old is the trailing value, which was kind of the intuition that we expressed. And if we think just about the beginning of our loop, this tells us how we need to initialize i. Because in order for new to initially be fib of i, new is fib of 1, or new is 1, so we need i to initially be 1. So because we set new to initially be fib of 1, we need i to initially be 1. That's the first constant that we definitely would have gotten wrong if we'd done this just by trying to guess and check. Um, and we, we did it just by trying to say, OK, like, what are the loop invariants that we're actually going to want to maintain? And then from that, that told us exactly how we needed to initialize the loop variable. Now, rather than thinking about the inside of the loop, I want to switch immediately to thinking about after the loop. And after the loop, we're going, to, uh, we're going to be returning new. If we return new, what does it mean for that to be the right answer? Well, we want, asserts another contract, uh, we want new to equal fib of in. Because that assertion is exactly the post condition of the function where we've substituted the result placeholder for new, which is the thing that we return. So, um, if we want new to be equal to fib of n, well, you may have some intuition for how to actually set the loop guard in order to do this. We're going to set the loop guard to be i less than n. And the reason that we're going to do this is we need to show that i is equal to n. We need to show that i is equal to n, because if we know that i is equal to n after the loop is finished, then we can use the, second, the last loop invariant and substitute i for n, and then we have the assertion. So substitution from the loop invariant gives us the assertion, substitution from the assertion gives us the post condition, and we're done. If we set i to be, uh, if we set the loop guard to be i is less than n, then we know after the function uh, terminates that uh, we know uh, that i is, that it's not the case that i is less than n. The loop exited, so the loop guard must be false. And if the loop guard is false, that means that i is greater than or equal to n. And if i is greater than or equal to n, and we need to know that i is equal to n, then the missing piece of this information is that that i is less than or equal to n. And how do we know that i is less than or equal to n? Well, that's another loop invariant. Obviously, in our loop, we're always going to keep i within the range between 1 and n. So we write that as a loop invariant. that uh, 1 is less than or equal to i, and i is less than or equal to n. And this gives us all the power we need to reason about our function. Remember at this point that um, the loop invariant is checked after the last iteration of the loop. So if I would tried to make this strict, then I would go over here and I'd try to run fib of 3, and I'd get a loop invariant failure, because my loop invariant, when I was about to exit the loop, would necessarily fail. So what I want to do is fix that code, and here is going to be the moment of truth where I can run with contracts on uh, fib of 4 and fib of 5. And OK, based on our prior, prior, prior discussion, if fib of 6 works, then we're just going to believe this is correct all the time. 
Um, and OK, good. So this is correct all the time. Um, this is, of course, with contracts on, a terrible algorithm because we're now running the inefficient version of our algorithm in a loop inside of our efficient algorithm. So like fib of 30 doesn't even work anymore. Um, this is, OK, good. It didn't crash my laptop. And, um, and so with uh, what I've just shown you uh, with this algorithm is a very quick picture of how we do two steps of three steps of reasoning. So we've shown logically that from the preconditions and initializations I do, the loop invariant will initially hold true. We've also shown that from our loop uh, invariant, I can reason logically about the post condition of our function being true. There's one step that's still missing which is that we need to show that the loop invariant actually like, you know, is a loop invariant. And the way that we walk through this is, again, I think really fun, but as I've already said, I'm a huge nerd. Um, this is the loop a little bit more close up. And uh, what we're going to do in order to think about how this, uh, make sure this loop invariant is actually preserved over an iteration of the loop is a process that's called symbolic evaluation which are scary words, but all you need to think about is that imagine you're waking up naive and innocent to the world in the middle of a loop, and you don't have any idea how many times that this has run before. Oh, this is basically the good place. And um, spoilers. Uh, the, um, um, and so all you know is that the loop invariants hold. Um, and so we've got old and new, and we know what the values are. I mean, we don't know what the values are, but we kind of know what the values are. We know old contains fib of i minus one, and we know new contains fib of i. And then the first thing we do is we say that next gets old plus new, which we also know as fib of i minus one plus fib of i, which we also know as the next Fibonacci number, right? So, okay, great. Now, think about what's going to happen on the next step. At the next line of code, I'm going to overwrite the value in old with the value in new. All right. And then I'm going to overwrite the value in new with the value in next. And I hope you follow that. Then the next step, OK, what's going to happen here? Because for loops are weird, so we go back up to the top. Before, mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is our loop increment. And at that point, we're going to first take next out of scope. And I'm going to admit here, I'm, at, I'm skipping a couple of steps that we do with the undergraduates. But um, what's actually happening is because we're increasing i, the value fib of i is now going to be fib of i minus 1. And having executed this loop increment, um, again, asking you to trust me a little bit, we're going to, uh, we can observe that we're done with the loop. And our loop invariant is restored because old still contains fib of i minus 1 and new still contains fib of i, even though all of those values have changed. Um, this is, again, a quick picture of how we've done a complete partial correctness proof of this Fibonacci function. We've shown that the precondition implies the loop invariant, that the loop invariant is preserved, that the loop invariant implies the post condition logically. We haven't shown that the function terminates, but of course it does. And with more than 10 you know, minutes to explain this, this is a kind of reasoning that we've successfully managed to teach to college freshmen. And you know what we can teach to, if we can teach something to college freshmen, it turns out that nowadays we can often teach that to computers. Um, yeah, you know, and um, and I and so this kind of reasoning that I've just performed is not only teachable as an educational project, but it's teachable to a computer that can check these proofs and make sure that the reasoning that we've done about contracts is always correct. I will admit it's not fun now. The college freshmen are fun. I love teaching college freshmen. But, uh, but working with the, the current uh, theorem proven technology is not, and contracts, it's not that much fun for the systems I've used. Like runtime contracts are fun. The, using theorem provens to prove contracts correct, it's, it's not fun. But I am convinced that fun in this instance is an engineering problem. Um, and so I, I believe we'll get there. <laughs> 
that's the last takeaway that I wanted to give you. So contracts, in addition to being about interfaces, are a scaffold for reasoning about programs. And if we go through this you know, not easy, but doable process of proving contracts correct, then we've got compile time guarantees that can uh, depend on the specific values our program sees at runtime. And if you've been scared by all the subliminal messages I've been giving you this whole talk, don't be. You've now seen dependent types. If you prove contracts correct, then you have compile time guarantees that depend on the specific values your program will see at runtime. Go to the little typer release party this evening. Be enlightened. It's, it's good. Um, and so that's the, uh, the, that's the third takeaway. I see that I am over time, so I'm going to skip the last conversation. There's a link on my website uh, about uh, TimSort, which is a fundamental sorting algorithm in every, comp in every uh, standard library and um, how we, uh, a bunch of people that work with the key theorem prover used TimSort, um, tried to prove it correct, had trouble, that was because there was a bug. They fixed the bug um, and then wrote some more contracts and proved that the function was correct. So uh, with that, I come back to my takeaways. The contracts, are a uh, contracts are a system that fills the gaps that are left by any type system and allows us to give a really fine-grained and detailed specification about what it means to be a correct input to our functions and interfaces. Contracts are great because they make tests way more awesome than they would otherwise be. Contracts are a way of really force multiplying the testing that we would already be doing. Um, and beyond testing, we can use contracts as a scaffold for writing documentation that's visible to programmers, but that also is a scaffold that you know, undergraduates and theorem provers can use to think about what it means for a program to be correct. Um, this is a web page with more information and links about the things that I wasn't able to talk about. And it also, so if you're interested in learning more about what I do as an independent computer science educator and curriculum designer, or you're interested in learning more about CNOT or TimSort um, or the Java modeling language, then I encourage you to go there for more information. And I really appreciate you all for attending today. Thank you.